My name's Anthony Saxby. Um, I'm from Microsoft, and I am uh, one of the product managers for the data platform and SQL Server in Microsoft UK. Um, I'm delighted to uh, be able to participate in this uh, first Big Data Insight forum today. One of the things that I think is quite interesting, given where we are in the, uh, in the scheme of Big Data, uh, there are no right answers at the moment. So it's a great opportunity for everybody to discuss their experiences, to talk about the kinds of challenges that they're facing, some of the opportunities that they're looking out for, and really sharing that, uh, that insight. So it's, it's great to, to, be, to be part of the, uh, part of the day. What I'm going to share is, is our thoughts and view from a, a sort of Microsoft point of view. It's not a product pitch before anybody gets up and, and leaves. What we're really talking about is the experiences that we have had in working with customers, the kind of things that we've seen, and therefore the kind of things that maybe you should be, uh, you should be thinking about. So let's hope the uh, picker works. So what's happening out there? Um, lots of stuff. Um, what we're seeing, and I'm sure what you're all seeing, is that the, the, the ongoing economics of the, the IT industry are continuing to drive massive change in the way that people work with, with IT, both at a, an organizational level uh, and at a personal level. Um, and we are seeing you know, explosions of the, both the volume and variety and, and speed with which uh, data is coming um, from the various endpoints in the, uh, in, in the sort of ecosystem that we have. So there's some examples here that uh, are interesting to look at. So this was produced a few months back, but uh, in, you know, when this was produced, in 60 seconds, there were approximately 700,000 Google searches. There were about 370,000 plus minutes of time spent on Skype talking to other people, and a huge number of different uh, activities that are driven by individuals and organizations across the world. Now, what I like to do in thinking about this is to break down the kind of information that is being driven by this, uh, this, um, uh, th these activities into three categories, because I think those categories are really important to think about when you're thinking about how big data influences the organization. So the categories are really around organizational processes, so the kind of actual data that many people have been generating and consuming for some time. So these are you know, typical either uh, purchasing processes or logistics processes, all of which are generating and have been generating data for a long time. However, the sort of new categories that are coming out more recently are what I'm classing as environmental data. So using a big picture word, uh, environment. So this is really thinking about the fact that in the environment within which we work and operate uh, today, many, many of the things that we work with have been um, are, are you know part of the IT ecosystem. So they're either generating data or consuming data or you know producing data in some sense or other. So these are the embedded systems that are within cars, within phones, within kiosks, within a range of different devices that we interact with on a daily basis. And what they're doing is capturing data about the way that the environment is uh, is working and the way that we are interacting with that environment. So that environmental data is an important new category of data. And then finally, we've got personal data in the sense of social data. And again, this is a, a fairly well-trodden path now, but with the massive explosion of social networking, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, um, there is now a massive amount of data around that historically didn't exist, which is really talking about how people are thinking socially, how they're interacting with other people, and the kind of things that are important to them in this world. So those three categories of data, business process, environmental, and personal social data, are creating the, the world in which suddenly you know, big data and all the implications of big data are, are highly important. One of the things that's quite interesting, and in a, in a term I think that McKinsey captured in a, in a well-read report a, a year or so back, is the idea of exhaust data. And this is that, in a lot of cases, the data that is being produced is almost being produced as a byproduct of some other activity. And that has implications, which I know many of you probably are thinking about, with respect to privacy and security of data as well. So this is something that we shouldn't really forget, because a lot of the sort of ongoing 
regulatory and broader concerns around big data are often parked in the, uh, in, the, in the sort of category of privacy and security concerns. And a lot of that is due to the way this data is being produced and captured. And we'll come back to talk a little bit about that later on. But security and privacy are, are key to be thinking about with respect to uh, the, the strategy that you're taking around big data. So some data stats. I think one of the things that's, uh, that's very true about big data is that people like to throw around big numbers. Um, and it was quite interesting to see some of the numbers that, uh, that were quoted in the, in the surveys that Emma talked us through. Um, a couple of years ago, um, McKinsey, again, in their, in their sort of uh, report, um, did some calculations or worked with the uh, various data that was available from uh, other sources to, to estimate the amount of data that existed um, currently in those, uh, in those industries. And they came to the conclusion that it was a t about 10 exabytes worth of data um, in the US uh, industries um, segmented across uh, the ones on, on, the, on the slide there. So 10 exabytes of data, we're talking about a very significant amount of, uh, amount of data there. And that was three years ago. So that will have moved forward from now. Another, another uh, piece of research sponsored, um, I think, by EMC, who are, who are jointly sponsoring this, uh, this activity today, predicted that that volume of data is likely to grow about 40 times between 2009 and 2020. So what does that actually translate into? Well, pro approximately 35 zettabytes of data. Now, for most of you, these numbers are, are fairly meaningless. Um, and so if you like analogies, which a lot of us do, then if you take 35 zettabytes of data and you put it onto DVDs, then that stack of D DVDs will reach from the Earth to about halfway to Mars. So if that gives you some idea of the kind of data volumes that we're talking about. And clearly, the key challenge is how do we decide which bits of that data are important, and how do we capture, manage, and produce insight from that data that isn't, that's going to enable us to, to move forward our organizational miss missions? To put some of this else, you know, put some of the, uh, these data uh, stats into other context, if you look at some of the major web and online properties that exist around the, the world today, so Facebook uh, and eBay, Facebook manages around 60 petabytes of data. So this is probably the, one of the largest online sites uh, that exists today. That's the kind of size of data that they're, they're managing. Facebook manages around 20 um, petabytes of data. So even those very, very large organizations that are highly dependent on uh, the kind of uh, data insight that we're talking about are, are managing you know, in petabytes rather than any, any, any scale beyond that at the moment. So why, why the sudden explosion of, of interest in, in data and big data? I think the key um, to this is the realization that because all of this data is really allowing us to understand behavior um, and understand behavior at a significant level of detail, people suddenly realized that it was too valuable to delete. And therefore, the problems that immediately uh, surfaced as a consequence of that were the challenges related to the fact that we need to keep this data online, we need to find new ways of capturing the data, and new ways of analyzing uh, and producing insights from the data. But the key realization, I think, that, uh, that, that people discovered, I think particularly through uh, realizing how important clickstream data was in the first instance or you know, data that's generated from, uh, from web properties was the, the recognition all of a sudden that there was within that data some very deep insight about the way that consumers were behaving or the way that, uh, um, or particularly consumers were behaving and that translates, as I said, into us looking at environmental data, data from embedded systems and also more detailed analytics around organizational process data and suddenly realize that when we're actually starting to understand behavior of systems, people, and organizations. And the key to that um, is the, the, the reduction in storage costs. So if storage still cost $100 a gigabyte, then there probably wouldn't be any big data explosion. Whereas these days, you can buy a two terabyte drive for around you know, 150 pounds 
and therefore when you're starting to think about storing petabytes of data, the, the cost of doing that becomes manageable, even for fairly small organizations. So two key, two key factors to why this is suddenly important. One, we can't delete this because there's too much insight in there that we um, don't yet necessarily understand, but we believe is in there. And secondly, the dramatic and further cost, in, uh, cost decline in, in storage, which enables us to store all of that data, make it available online, and therefore dig into it in more, in more detail. Ultimately, I think the thing that pretty much everybody in the room will probably be trying to think through is how we can use the understanding that we will have of the behavior of these parts of the ecosystem to predict the future. So whether that be understanding how to recommend certain products to people who have had, had got a previous purchase history, or looking at trading patterns and algorithms to work out what, where people um, are likely to be buying and selling um, commodities in the future. A lot of this is to do with about predicting the future. Uh, and so when we look at the particular use cases that we're talking about, we should look at that in terms of how this is helping us to make better decisions by understanding how we think people and systems are going to behave in the future. The three V's are key to what makes big data big. We've talked a lot about volume already. Um, the other two V's are important. And in fact, this, these three V's really came out of a report that uh, the Meta Group did about 10 years ago now. So these three V's are quite long in the tooth in some respects, but they continue to be an important way of thinking about the challenges that we face. So from a velocity point of view, real time and event driven is something that is very real and important to everybody in the room. People have an innate expectation and desire to feel that they're looking at the most up-to-date version of the, uh, the, the, the data that they can look at, and they're impatient, generally, with respect to waiting for that data to become available. And so velocity is really all about recognizing the fact that more and more of the big data kind of problems that people will be looking to tackle are about trying to understand what's happening now rather than what was happening 10 minutes ago or two weeks ago or a year ago. Um, so we need to really understand how we bring velocity into the, uh, into the challenges that we're, that we're looking at. Some examples of that. So one of the things I was reading about over the weekend, actually, which I hadn't uh, fully uh, appreciated before, is that the, uh, the government are actually looking to introduce a real-time uh, PAYE system, so business of, of all sizes will be, look, will be asked over the next couple of years, I believe, to supply tax and PAY information for their employees at, you know, on, you know, at, in real time to HMRC. The, the reason for that is to ensure that uh, businesses don't have to go through the end of year cycle, but obviously it's impact, important and valuable to both the government and to employees to ensure that they have an up-to-date view of their tax position, and they understand whether they're paying the correct tax or not. Um, and that in and of itself will generate value and try and you know, simplify people's life uh, to a great extent. And so I think that's a, that's a great example of, of, of how real time can start to become very significant to the way that uh, people think about data. Variety is the complexity. And what we'll find as we go through big data challenges is that one of the key uh, scenarios that people will want to look at is to bring in lots of different types of data sources. What we're finding generally is that insight is better enabled by having data from multiple different sources and finding correlations between them. That introduces a set of challenges with regard to how easy it is to manage the variety of, of data, the kind of tools and techniques that are used to analyze uh, and uh, investigate that data and the types of approaches that people take to do that. So what's, what, you know, fundamentally what's happening and what's driving this is that the traditional time cycle for analytics is changing. So not that long ago, there was a typical cycle that organizations would go through in terms of trying to tackle analytical problems. So somebody in the business would probably say, I need to understand this about the business or I need to understand what's happening here. 
IT would you know, be given that question. They'd spend days, weeks, or months trying to work out how to get the data that they wanted to, uh, to use to answer that question, build a report that, uh, that tried to provide the, uh, the output that uh, the business was looking for, load the data, um, test the report, and then provide that report back to the business. That time cycle is too, too long now. Um, all businesses require insight as quickly as possible, and they need that insight to be available as many, to as many people in the organization as possible. And so the key, one, some of the key drivers around big data are things like creating transparency. So rather than having a long, tortuous process that is used to get data from systems out to users, what we want is for users to have access to that data at will, um, security and privacy aside. What we also want to do is to encourage experimentation. So we want users, whether they be data scientists um, in some cases, or just your average marketing person or your average finance person, we want people to be able to have the tools to enable them to experiment with data. So experimentation is a key feature of big data and is something that we need to enable. Fundamentally, you know, one of the key drivers for value in big data is being able to segment and understand parts of your market, your customer base, your supplier base, to be able to break down problems and to personalize and tailor your, ta your activities and tasks to be as efficient and effective as possible at tackling that, uh, that audience. The other part of big data is really about automating and supporting decision making. So again, we need to make sure that data is available in a form that enables uh, people to either make better decisions or to enable decisions that are inherently incredibly complex to be better supported with data and insight that, uh, that is useful and relevant to the question they're trying to ask. And last but not least, we're expecting, and I know many people in the room will be anticipating that this is really all about finding new business models. So where can we genuinely make a, a change in the market that enables us to leapfrog our competition? We've got some examples of working with customers already that are about either insight, transparency, or new business models. So we're working with a very large search portal organization using some of our early uh, implementations of big data technologies. And we're finding that they have been able to use, that, uh, use those technologies to, to double their ad revenue that comes about as a result of their portal and search capabilities through processing very large amounts of data, so three and a half billion or so events a, a day from uh, users of their, of their site. But by correctly interpreting that data, they've been able to segment their uh, user base and enable their uh, advertising clients to be able to more effectively target ads at that uh, audience base, which has enabled them to double their advertising revenue. So they've seen a significant advance in their business through using big data to more effectively target their, their client base. Manufacturing organization, so this is more an internal view, and it's quite interesting. Large, large manufacturing organization, they're actually using um, internal um, social traffic, so uh, for their, from their internal use of social networking, to understand how users are feeling about the delivery of IT services. So are users happy with the IT service? Is it working in the way that they expect it to? And what kind of things does the IT department need to do to improve uh, the, the IT service that they're delivering to the, to the business? Um, also, alongside that, they're doing things like trying to understand particular users and what kind of PR or news stories they might be interested in. So thinking about this whole kind of idea of recommendations, how do we in inform users within the organization through understanding what their interests are, on activities that are going, outside, uh, going on outside the organization and having them more informed as a, as a result. Finally, we're working with uh, a, a company called Clout, which some of you may have heard of, but others not. They're a fairly new organization. And they have genuinely created a brand new business out of big data. So what Clout do is that they capture uh, social networking <coughs> feeds to understand how, how much clout or how um, important, in quotes, a given individual is with regard to their followers and the kind of actions that their followers take as a result of them 
tweeting or sending out status updates um, or whatever. And through that, what they're doing is creating a clout index, which is the number between 1 and 10, which really indicates how important a person's presence is in the, in the sort of social networking world and, in theory, how much impact they have in terms of taking actions. Now, you know, this is obviously trialling a brand new business model. I guess nobody knows really whether or not that's something that will stand the test of time, really, you know, continue to be seen by their customers as valuable. However, at the moment, there are plenty of people across the world who pay subscriptions to understand what their clout index <coughs> is. It's kind of like a credit score, but, you know, for, for your impact and supposed importance in the world of social media. Um, and, you know, we don't know, but it's, the, it's a great example of a new business model that, is, that is, has been created off the back of analyzing big data and understanding how they can use that to offer a service back to, uh, back to the community. So we've talked a little bit about um, some of the things that we're seeing and some of the context for big data. What I want to do now is to talk a bit about three of what we feel, based on the, the work that we've done, are, are probably the critical success factors to, taking a, uh, to implementing a, a, a big data strategy. These are largely around people, so your users and your business. So how do we bring those people into, uh, into, the, uh, into the big data world. How do we cope with the volume, variety, and velocity of the data? What are the kind of things that you need to think about? What are the kind of challenges that will be faced? And what um, strategies do we need to adopt in order to be able to cope with that successfully? And finally, what about the rest of the world and the world's data? So what, what, you know, what's your role as organizations within the world of data? Is it producers, is it consumers, or is it, uh, is it a bit of both? From a user point of view, I think one of the things that we see most frequently in the way that we, uh, we're interacting with clients and how we see clients be successful in looking at uh, and using analytics and big data type uh, technologies to impact their business is the importance of users. Um, it's, you know, hopefully this is a, is a sort of, you know, a truth that everybody believes now, but, you know, the insight that, uh, that users have with respect to what they're trying to achieve within business and their ability to be able to take um, their requirements and their, and their needs and be able to rapidly get access to visualization and analytics tools uh, is something that is the difference between making uh, a big data implementation or project successful and not. You know, we've talked a bit about how difficult people find the ongoing and lengthy cycle of doing reporting and analytics. And so the, one of the key, uh, the key critical success factors is making the tools and technologies available to end users in a form that they can use to get access to, uh, to data and to produce that insight as, as quickly as possible. Um, one of the things that uh, we've noticed is that Visualization, i.e. the ability to be able to graphically look at patterns in data, is something that, you know, understandably, large numbers of end users are, are keen uh, on, on taking advantage of. And, you know, visualization is not just in the form of simple graphs and, uh, and pie charts and such like, but more and more we're starting to now see that this technology is used together with mapping technologies and other sort of geospatial technologies to bring um, a completely different perspective on the, on the sort of world of data. So we've been working with uh, uh, Knight Frank actually recently through the, the SQL 2012 launch. And one of the things that they've done is to introduce a, a system to their, uh, their uh, consulting organization that uses geospatial data, data as well as data around, the, uh, around all of their um, property sites and property activities across the across the uh, the country and the world to really understand from a geographical point of view what's happening and that visualization that people that uh, that they've been able to to uh, to get access to has really helped them to make a big difference to the way they interact with clients and the kind of uh, services that they are able to uh, to offer to clients 
in a similar vein, uh, we've been working with various media and, and advertising organizations. And one of the, the, the trends that, uh, that we're noticing around visualization and, and, and end user access is the importance of being able to offer your customers, so not just your internal users, but your customers access to data uh, in a form that enables them to understand what's happening. So in, in advertising, one of the very strong trends is to offer clients, you know, the people that are effectively paying for the campaigns, deep and interactive <coughs> analytics that enable them to understand how the campaigns are performing and where they need to focus on in order to try and optimize the, the spend. And so think of visualization and, uh, and, and offering end user uh, tools, not just within your organization, but think about that in terms of offering those tools and capabilities out to your clients as well as part of your, as part of your big data strategy. Collaboration is another key part to the end user story, and, and, in, and in particular, secure collaboration. So again, you know, Knight Frank being a, a, a great example, one of the, the key advantages that they, uh, they found in having got access to insight and data through the, the big data back end is that it enabled them to more effectively collaborate among both uh, different parts of the, the country and obviously different people within the, the organization in order to solve problems. So, we, uh, so collaboration you know, is, a, is a key part of uh, the, the end user story. Bringing together the world of structured and unstructured data is key. So Hadoop obviously is, is, is gaining a huge amount of traction. And when we think about unstructured data, um, the sort of traditional uh, or the, the, the new form of data that people are looking at, Hadoop and the, uh, the ability for people to, to, to utilize Hadoop is, is, is a, as a key investment that, uh, that, that folk will be looking to make. And in particular, that's really important because whilst at the moment most people have most of their data in structured forms, what's happening is that the, the kind of additional variety of data that people are trying to use to, to gain additional insight is really coming in in the form that is best suited to both the experimentation capabilities but also the ability to have a very much more detailed and more flexible way of analyzing that data that, that Hadoop and, uh, and its kind of ecosystem of capabilities offer. So Hadoop brings with it a whole new world of capabilities and, and, uh, and potential. However, again, what we're finding, and certainly some of the previous examples, where they really had to focus on in order to gain maximum value from their uh, big data projects, was to bring their unstructured world together with their structured world. So how do we get Hadoop data into traditional uh, um, analysis services cubes uh, and such like to be able to take advantage of that data in tools that end users need to use? So we see being able to bring together structured and unstructured data as being a key part of people's uh, strategy. And it's horses for courses. So one of the things that um, I think people don't necessarily appreciate yet is the amount of engineering focus that's going into all of these technologies. So both from a traditional structured MPP data warehousing point of view, as well as Hadoop. But right now and for the foreseeable future, it's important that people select technologies to do to, uh, that are going to be appropriate to tackle the kind of problems that they are, they're, they're solving. And one of the things that we're, we're taking very careful note of is the relative performance of Hadoop versus the, our MPP database, and really trying to make sure that we, we track that carefully, recognizing that our, there is engineering optimization going into each of those. Because right now what we're seeing is for the kind of slicing and dicing and kind of multi-dimensional analysis that many people want to do, con still, you know, continue to do, actually that is far faster to do in a traditional um, structured data uh, warehouse because of the opportunities that that, uh, that platform has around uh, um, optimization and understanding the way data is placed to enable uh, queries to run very quickly. So one of the things that you should definitely be thinking about when you're thinking about your broad strategy of data is how do you bring together the unstructured world and the structured world and how do you use the particular data platforms that you've got in order to give you the kind of performance and capability that you, uh, that you need. 
In terms of um, building big data platforms, um, obviously trying to tackle the, the process of engineering large platforms can be very expensive. And obviously, you know, where I'm sure if, you, if many of you have already started to try and build Hadoop clusters, one of the things that you'll have noticed is that you know, for a relatively immature technology like Hadoop, the construction of those uh, clusters is, is, no, is no mean feat and requires some significant engineering effort. Um, on the flip side of that, obviously we're seeing um, various trends in the industry that are really focused on trying to reduce the cost of engineering large-scale data platforms. So for traditional structured environments, one of the things that we certainly are working on, and I, and I know most of the other vendors are working on, is how we can provide people with higher level building blocks that are less costly to engineer and easier to keep operating optimally. And so the idea of reference architectures, so these are the kind of blueprints that people uh, can get access to to enable them to reduce the amount of engineering, custom engineering that, uh, that needs to go on to build the very large data platforms, right through to appliances which are you know, completely pre-built packages are really there to enable people to leverage their existing capabilities and investments, but, but to actually take advantage of engineering uh, effort that's being done elsewhere to be able to, to deliver platforms more quickly and more cheaply. The cloud is a really important part of the big data story, um, and I've touched on it very uh, briefly already, but one of the things that we see more and more is the fact that data is something that both your organizations will have, but also there is a huge amount of data elsewhere in the world. So the Azure data market uh, is an example of a commercial data market where there are literally hundreds of uh, sources of data that can be used to uh, bring in and, and work with data that you own to, to enable you to, to, to uh, achieve uh, greater insights. The, the various kind of governments around the world are also very focused on open data and creating more transparency. And therefore, we're seeing good examples of where people are not, a, not only using commercial data, but are using you know, government data. So one of, the, one of the projects that we worked on with Transport for London a year or two back was the idea of opening up their uh, travel data to enable people to understand um, what kind of uh, a journey to work they're going to have in, in London. And that idea of being able to kind of give that data available out freely and encourage the ecosystem of developers to take that data and build applications around it to help uh, the travelers within London is a great example of the idea of being able to use data and use, use data and create an ecosystem to uh, uh, encourage uh, the value to be able to, to, to be pulled out of that. And obviously social network and sentiment analysis is a key uh, platform now that a lot of people are interested in bringing, it, uh, in bringing that kind of data in to, to build into their, uh, their big data efforts. So overall, what we have seen is that big data really requires an end-to-end -end approach. So we need to tackle the user challenge, both from a visualization, analytics, and collaboration point of view. We need to be able to tackle the data platform challenge. So we need to bring together real-time data, structured data, unstructured data. We need to recognize that we are part of a broader ecosystem. So we need to think about how we can consume and create data <coughs> feeds that will enable other people to, to, to drive value and to improve the commercial value of our organization. So taking that end-to-end -end approach will enable people to maximize the, uh, the success that they, they have in adopting big data. There are a few other places that you can go to, uh, to learn about that on the, uh, on the Microsoft website. And we have a preview of Hadoop for Windows Azure that, uh, that uh, many, a few of you may already be aware of. Um, there is a link there that you can look at to, uh, to, uh, to see what we're doing around um, Hadoop on Azure. And so with that, I'll finish my session. Um, we, I don't know whether we have any time for questions. Um, I'm looking for some guidance. So we've got a couple of minutes for questions, if anybody has any that, uh, that have come out of my, uh, my session.
I don't know whether that's a good thing or not, but thank you anyway for, uh, 